Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we've got a brand new project for you and I'm excited to show it to you. My name's LT and on this channel we build custom, high performance and lately a whole lot of off-road trucks. So if that stuff interests you, help me out and hit that subscribe button because we are trying to reach 100,000 subs by the end of this year and I know we can make it happen, I just need you to click that little red button. So, the very last vehicle that we finished up in the shop here was an XJ Cherokee. It was a 98 two-door sport, and we did an LS swap in it. It had a six-liter LQ4, 4L60 automatic. Uh, I did all the custom exhaust fabrication, the wiring, and everything else that would need to do to get the engine in and get it running and driving. So, that one is out the door, and now we're on to the next project. It's also a Jeep, and it looks from the front a lot like an XJ, but its letter designation starts with an M. That's right, guys. We're building the Comanche. So I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to use for a title or a thumbnail on this video, but I'm sure I'll have some giveaway that'll let you know we're gonna be building a custom exhaust. So we're gonna be doing a lot of welding, cutting, and fabricating today on this MJ Comanche. But before we get to any of that, I just wanted to feature the truck and kind of show off some of the cool parts of it because this is 100% owner built and it's a really capable off-road rig and he goes wheeling with it all the time. So. Uh, from the front, these MJ Comanches are kind of confusing because it looks just like an XJ Cherokee. And that's because from the doors forward, they're pretty much the same thing. But it's got a pickup bed on back. Now these are a little bit unique because it has a unibody construction from basically all the way front to back. But the frame rails are part of the cab and they're separate from the bed. So you can remove the bed, but it has a unibody frame rail. So it's just kind of a really cool construction. Um, out back, he said he bobbed it, I think six to nine inches shorter. So the tailgate normally would have been out here, brought it up here, which gives it a better departure angle for wheeling and stuff. It's got 37s on it, bead locks, one ton axles. I believe it's a Dana, uh, 14 bolt GM, Dana 60 up front. And suspension wise, the first thing you'll notice is that it has a coilover shock up front instead of a coil spring and separate shock, which these MJs and XJs normally have. Now I'm pretty sure this would technically be considered a radius arm setup. Again, this is all custom built by the owner. So this is similar to a Rusty's kit over here. Uh, so you got the pivot there, one arm with a second link coming off of that's a radius arm. But on the far side, there is no second link up top, but I'm pretty sure this is still considered a radius arm. Some people maybe would call it a three link, uh, but because this short link here is connected to the main bar, I'm gonna call it a radius arm. Um, it's got a crossover, or a track bar up front, crossover steering, of course, hydraulic assist on the steering. It's not full hydro, but it does have a hydraulic assist. Uh, custom front bumpers with a winch, that looks really cool. I uh, got the heavy duty fenders here to make room for more tire action and they're, I don't know, these are like what, eighth inch, three sixteenths maybe. My very favorite part about the whole build right here are the half doors. I think that's just a really cool off-road setup and I want to try this on some build of mine at some point in the future, but uh, it's got a cup holder in the top of the door and then you can kind of see over here has a Jeep CJ outside door handle on the inside. And that's what you use to open and shut the doors. It has a stock striker, stock hinge set up there. So boom, doors open and shut. Rock sliders, it has an internal roll cage, has a bed cage. Uh, the rear suspension is pretty cool too. Um, it's got a long link there on the bottom and I like how we mounted it close to the center line of the axle. That gives him extra ground clearance. Axle truss up top. Those I believe are a JK stock height coil spring. It's got a GM, uh, rubber bumper in there um, and then the cool part the wishbone that locates the axle laterally is mounted towards the rear this is kind of popular in like the mini truck and an airbag type of stuff but the main point of doing that is 
right there. The fuel tank kind of pro prohibits you from running a wishbone link mounted towards the front. Um, so we've got a locker in there, 513 gears. I'm pretty sure he said Bilstein 7100 shocks. Uh, another cool bumper. And this vehicle, it definitely has earned a little bit of body damage over the years. Like I mentioned, he goes wheeling all the times, uh, all the time. He's got a lot of cool stickers on here, badges rather, that show where he's been. Um, Hell's Revenge, Top of the World, Metal Masher, Rubicon Trail, Pritchett's Canyon, Cliffhanger, Steel Bender, Poison Spider, Fins and Things. I can't admit that I am entirely familiar with all those trails. I know I've heard a lot of them. Um, so this is a very capable rig. The owner uses it all the time. Like I said, today we're going to be doing an exhaust. So the existing exhaust system starts right here below the intake with the stock manifold. Uh, he's worried you might have a couple of small cracks on there, but we're just going to start from scratch and replace it with a header. And I'll show you all the parts in a second. So uh, today's job, manifold off, header on, and we'll weld the V-band onto the header instead of the factory style connection. And then the rest of the exhaust, I'll show you down here. Um, first of all, guys, let me just give this disclaimer. I've got nothing against muffler shops, um, but that being said, I have seen a lot of exhaust systems constructed from just your regular muffler shops that they're not necessarily the best quality. Yeah, they'll get the exhaust gas from point A to point B, but sometimes there's a lot of shortcomings, especially when you have a customized vehicle like this, whether that's you know, you have requirements for better ground clearance or sometimes just the welds they put on there, they're MIG welded, they just kind of look horrible. Um, I'll admit I do have pretty high standards when it comes to exhaust. Everything I do is gonna be stainless steel and it's gonna be TIG welded front to back. Uh, so again, I'm not really trash talking muffler shops or every muff muffler shop, but there are definitely some out there who, I don't know, I don't know. Well, we'll leave it at that. But let me show you what we're working with here. So this piece was kind of scabbed together for some weird reason. The bends on this system are just traditional muffler shop style crimp bends. So you do lose a little bit of radius there. Um, that pipe is kind of what bugs me the most because look how far it sticks down below the engine. Yeah, sure, it might not hit anything because you've got this link here, which is a little bit lower than it. But at the same time, there's no reason why it should hang down quite so low. So we've got one section there kind of scabbed together to this section there. It goes up above. There's a muffler way back there somewhere and it just kind of dumps below the axle. Um, the exhaust does have plenty of clearance right here, so I've got no problem with that. But the one thing we are gonna do differently is have the exhaust exit come through the bedside right through this general area. It's kind of gonna be dictated by what's behind there because there is some bracing and stuff on the back side of the bedside. Uh, but that's what we're gonna go for. And I'll maybe even try to do like one of those kind of oval teardrop shapes on the outlet. So we'll see how that goes. In terms of parts, here's what the owner supplied. We've got a header. It's a three into two into one design. Uh, no idea on the brand. I will try to put it up on the screen here who makes that header. Uh, and this is the rest of the supplies that he brought me. Um, first of all, we got a builder's kit here. Uh, this is a Summit builder's kit. I think we got two and a quarter maybe. Um, so we've got four of everything. 490s, 4 180s, 4 45s, and four straight sections of pipe. So this is way more material than we are going to use, but uh, he can save the rest for something else. We've got a Magnaflow muffler, the header I showed you. We've got two V-band clamps. We've got a flex pipe in that box there. And a couple of different options for hangers. We got these from Vibrant. Um, these are stainless steel weld on barb clamps and we've got the four isolators to go with them. And then he also picked up one of these. Uh, I'm not sure what the brand was, but I also like this style. And this I might end up using on the back because that'll provide the most rigid mounting solution so the pipe doesn't wiggle and hit the bedside. Also, um, some stage eight fasteners that we're gonna use to lock the header in place. Um, so none of the bolts back out. Anyway, that's the parts we're gonna use. That's the vehicle that we're building on. So the only thing we have left to do is to get started by tearing apart that intake manifold so we get the header bolted on.
So it was a pretty simple job removing the intake manifold, which then allows us to remove the exhaust manifold. And strictly from a performance standpoint, there are a couple of disadvantages to this design. I would kind of consider this more like a log manifold. Uh, cylinders number two and five, they kind of enter the log at almost a 90 degree angle. So that's definitely not ideal for flow. Uh, three and four, those are a little bit smoother. And then one and six, those basically just enter right into the main portion of the log. And then finally, the last two uh, logs join together in more of a traditional merge style I wouldn't quite call it a collector, but that's basically what it is. So um, by going with the design that we're going with, it has two mini collectors and then a third collector down below with a new header. We're definitely gonna improve horsepower by a little bit. I have no idea what they advertise the gains as. It's probably not gonna be huge or you might not even feel it at all. But in theory, the style of header that we're installing will improve horsepower somewhat. So to get the intake manifold off, it's basically just a process of removing all the wiring from it. Uh, you've got to remove the power steering pump because there's a bolt on the power steering pump bracket that's covered up by the pump and the bolt goes through the bracket into the intake manifold. So power steering pump and power steering pump bracket do need to be removed. But once you get that out of the way, you have a lot more access. You can reach your arm underneath the intake manifold to get all the bottom row of bolts out. And then once that's out, intake comes off, exhaust manifold follows. I've got the flange on the cylinder head completely cleaned up. I uh, just rubbed down the brake clean, took a little scraper. There's a few spots where the gasket material kind of deposited itself onto the cylinder head, but we scraped that up, everything is clean. And now I have the header mocked up onto the engine. So if we were gonna be installing this header and attaching it to the stock exhaust, we'd basically be ready to put this thing back together again. But that flange right down there, that's a stock style flange. We're actually gonna be chopping that off and installing just a traditional V-band. And it's kind of hard to tell from here, but there's a slight, slight bend right there as it enters the flange. And we're gonna get rid of that and straighten it out, which will allow us the opportunity to install a V-band and get rid of that first kind of offset jog that comes right off the manifold. It kind of comes out of the manifold and then it has to come back down. So by getting rid of that little angle on the manifold, we'll come straight down. So it'll be, again, a slightly better flow. None of this is gonna be really measurable, but the reason we actually can do that now is because we're not running a stock style of suspension. And I think the reason why they had to jog that pipe over so harshly off the manifold is because there used to be a differential and an upper control arm there when this Jeep was stock. So um, I did a quick test fit to make sure that all the bolts will line up because um, there's a common mating surface or a common fastener rather, like right this, this one right here, the bolt goes halfway over the header and halfway over the intake manifold. And there's all of them are pretty much like that except for the center one there, that's a dedicated exhaust bolt. And the two end ones, those are also each dedicated exhaust bolts. But just to be sure, because sometimes aftermarket parts don't fit that well, I checked every single bolt along here and it goes right in, which is actually kind of rare because most headers that I put on, you, it seems like you always have to oval out one hole here or there just a little bit, but we don't have to do that on this one. So now that I know everything is gonna fit, we'll take the header off, cut the flange off and start welding. <music>
So remember that whole thing I said about how this header fits perfectly right out of the box and it was kind of rare for aftermarket parts and I was so happy that it actually fit? Well, forget everything I said because it actually didn't fit that good at all. Uh, so it actually bolted up to the cylinder head no problem, all the fasteners fit. So the flange was fine, but the major problem was the interference on primary number six and the intake manifold. Now, a lot of inline sixes, the four liter included, have the intake and exhaust manifold bolted to the same side of the engine. And it's really critical that you get a good sealing surface between both the intake manifold and the cylinder head and the exhaust manifold and the cylinder head so you don't have vacuum leaks or exhaust leaks. Now, whenever I put the intake manifold on for the first time, it kind of looked like everything lined up. There's two dowel pins, uh, one on the front, one on the back, that kind of locate everything. But before I started tightening the fasteners down, I started looking and you could kind of see like on this one here, down towards the bottom, there was a pretty significant gap where on the top it was touching. Or in other words, basically the manifold was kind of sitting a little bit higher than it was supposed to. It was supposed to be sitting square against the head and it was kind of cocked up. So I was trying to figure out what was going on there. At first, I thought maybe it was just the shape of the flange was not allowing the uh, intake manifold to sit onto the dowel pins, but it wasn't that. It was actually primary number six. Now, I had to actually get the hammer out, which I hate pounding on headers and stuff, but there's really no other way around it. I had to dent in the tube, which whether or not we like to admit is kind of standard stuff when it comes to fitting headers. So primary number six, uh, right where it exited the cylinder. Now this is the old manifold. And on this one, you kind of see how the primary comes down quite a bit before it goes back where on the header, it kind of started to go back right away. And there's a little spot right here where it would interfere with the intake manifold and it wouldn't allow the intake to bolt onto the cylinder head properly. So here's just a word of caution whenever you're working with, you know, any aftermarket parts on an engine like this or any inline six, just make sure things are lining up before you put the bolts in and before you crank it down because I could get all the bolts to start. And if I didn't pay attention and if I just tried to tighten these bolts down, you definitely would be able to crack the intake manifold or even if you did get them to tighten down and you went to start it up, you have a massive vacuum leak because there's like an eighth of an inch gap down on the bottom side. Um, and it was really obvious I got underneath the truck with a flash and I was able to look at it. So kind of what I did, uh, I just had to, I took some red Sharpie marker and I just kind of colored on everything, um, spots where I thought it might interfere. I tried to put the intake on, I just kind of wiggled it a little bit and that'll rub off the Sharpie, you know, exactly where the interference is. And then you just get the hammer, dent the tube in. I just, I try to do it a little bit at a time. It, I had the intake on and off like probably five or six times, just denting it a little bit at a time and then making sure I had clearance. And my final trick, just to make sure I know nothing is rubbing, because uh, you also don't want it to be touching because it will transfer a little bit more heat into the intake manifold. I uh, just take a small sticky note piece of paper, something folded in half, and that's maybe like 10 thousandths of an inch. You just try to see if you can slide the paper in and out in between the interference area. Now I've got it where I've got at least the thickness of two pieces of paper, uh, or you know, one piece folded in half. So I know everything fits perfectly. There's no interference. Now the intake is bolted onto the cylinder head, perfectly flat. And so we shouldn't have any leaks. Now I've got to put the rest of the wiring stuff back on here. I just kind of flopped it all over to the side there. So next thing I'm going to do is put all the wiring back on, put the intake back on, put the power steering pump back on. And then just to kind of make sure everything is copacetic on this, I'll just start it up uh, without having the exhaust on yet, but just to make sure it idles at a normal idle speed. And basically that will tell me I've got no vacuum leaks. So uh, I'll get all that on, start it up, idle it, and then we'll see what's next.
I've got the wiring harness 100% put back together. I have the power steering set up in place. And I started up the Jeep just to kind of let it, first of all, cook off all the oils and stuff that are on the header. That's just part of the manufacturing process. And it's totally normal to see a bunch of smoke when you first fire up you know, a setup like this. And also, and more importantly, just to kind of make sure that there's no vacuum leaks and that the thing idles at a proper RPM. Because if that manifold were cocked on there sideways, you know, the thing would idle probably at like 2000 RPM or something crazy like that. So anyway, it fired right up, everything idles fine. I let it run for probably a minute just to kind of burn off anything that's in the header. And now we can move on to the rest of the exhaust system. Now, a lot of the steps that I showed you here today installing this header are applicable pretty much to any Jeep product that has a four liter in it, whether that's a Cherokee, I think some ZJ Grand Cherokees used a four liter, uh, you know, CJs, TJs, whatever else they put this four liter in, the steps are pretty much all gonna be the same. It's actually super simple to pop the intake off, just be very careful when you put it back on, especially if you have a different header, that the intake sits flat against the head and that you're not gonna break it when you tighten up the bolt like say if it were cocked off sideways. So um, just, just with anything though, you wanna make sure you take your time and make sure everything fits right before you go cranking it back together. Um, finally, a lot of people will ask the question, is it worth it to install a header? Are you gonna notice a performance difference? Uh, are you gonna notice? Probably not. I mean, these four liters, I have no idea what they're rated at, like maybe 190, 195 horsepower you're probably not gonna notice like a huge, huge seat of the pants difference. But yeah, in theory, you're definitely gonna increase the power a little bit because you're reducing restriction in the exhaust system. And if in our case, you compare the header with a little bit larger exhaust system, because this one on here, parts of it are like two inch and they're crimped and smashed and they're really small. Um, yeah, I know I've seen the Engine Masters episode where they smash pipes and it doesn't make a huge difference. But having the properly sized exhaust system for any engine is definitely important. So our old header here, I looked it over. It seems to be in pretty fair condition. I didn't find any major cracks or anything like that. Uh, but since we're going through the effort of replacing the rest of the exhaust with something that's going to be you know, a little bit higher quality than what's on there, it just makes sense to replace everything. And the added slight increase in performance, no matter how small, also an added bonus. So that's gonna bring this video to an end. And I gotta say thank you guys for watching all the way through to the end. I do appreciate that. Help me out though, if you don't mind, please hit that subscribe button. If you haven't already, click the like button. And then finally, drop a comment down below. You know, let me know what you think about Chris's Jeep here, because this thing, in my opinion, is really awesome. And all those interactions, the likes, the comments, and the subscribe, that helps this channel grow. It boosts it in the algorithm, and that's all stuff that I'd like to see. So thank you for that. I'll catch you guys in a couple days with the next upload. We're going to be building some exhaust.